So this paper focuses on the relevance of national youth councils in the Caribbean as a structure of youth representation in today's society. The case presented is that national youth councils are relevant and they are the best platforms for engaging and facilitating youth participation in governance and national development. And NYC, however, cannot function without the support of other stakeholders in the development process and therefore should be regarded equally in the allocation of resources and the composition of inclusive processes at all national levels. As youth-led structures, there must be confidence in the ability of NYCs to make valid contributions to the to make accurate representation of the youth sector in their respective countries. The evolution of national youth councils. According to a World Bank publication entitled Caribbean Youth Development, Issues and Policy Directions, efforts at national youth council structures have existed in the Caribbean for as far back as the 1950s, with the 60s and 70s period described as one of political foment in the region. It must be noted, however, that the traces of NYCs in the region go as far back as the 1940s, with the example of Trinidad and Tobago National Youth Council. The interest of youth in National Youth Councils, however, reached its peak in the mid-1980s, when the United Nations General Assembly observed the year 1985 as the first international youth year under the theme Participation, Development and Peace. And since then, the region saw an influx in the participation of youth in matters of governance and politics. That same report stated that national youth councils have been seen as significant structures for the expression of youth views and for taking the desires of youth to the corridors of power and decision making. At the time, young activists were sufficiently sensitized to the political and developmental issues. And as young people, they thought it their responsibility to posit youth views on current issues. National youth leaders emerged not because they were provided with opportunities, but because they created opportunities to voice the concerns of their peers. Youth council leaders and politics. According to the very same World Bank report, which is basically the only report that literally focuses on national youth councils in, in, in some of its sections, and all other data will be scattered on different, um, in different locations. The majority of data on national youth councils will be found in individuals with institutional memory in the region, which is why we have embarked upon the MOU with Sally Sales to do a documentary on NYCs in the region. The report states the forthrightness of youth leaders in those councils often placed them in stark opposition to the political status quo. However, their soundness, articulate expressions, and strong personalities often made them political targets of recruitment into political parties, which many of them pursued successfully. I can control this myself. All right. So, looking at what exists today, national youth councils, and in the context of the CIYC, the CIYC is a network of national youth councils. In this uh, this structure, you will see NYO because the focus is really on a national youth organization, a structure that represents young people. So, in different countries, you will find different names to represent a National Youth Council, and not all will hold the term NYC. However, CIYC is a network of these national youth organizations. So what is a National Youth Council? What is it supposed to be? An umbrella body that coordinates the work of youth organizations and represents the collective views and opinions of young people. There are different variations of this structure where you find some are youth-driven, Others are state-led, that's across the world, not just not, not in the Caribbean really. And you have youth parliaments. For example, St. Kitts and Nevis started out as a youth parliament organized by the state, but later on the youth decided to actually say, transform it into a non-profit organization. So in that sense, a youth parliament, as long as it can actually more, you can say, metamorphosize, in a sense, into a structure that represents all young persons, you could consider it a national youth body. The principal difference, therefore, is that the National Youth Council is youth-driven and non-governmental. NYCs pride themselves in being non-partisan, and most importantly, being representative of a wide cross-section of youth. Most, if not all, NYCs are made up constitutionally of national youth and sports clubs, various interest groups, student organizations, and other community-based organizations as is the case in St. Lucia, the Bahamas, Jamaica, Barbados, and Dominica. 
provision is also made within the constitutions to not exclude the unattached sector of youth. So here is an example, I, in fact, this was the history, an example of the, the typical structure of a National Youth Council, using Central Channel as an example. The first diagram shows you the three levels of leadership or decision making in a NYC. At the top, as well as the bottom, you have the General Assembly, which is the highest decision making body within the NYC. That, out of the General Assembly, you have the General Council, which is made up of two representatives from every district branch of the National Youth Council. And you have the Central Executive, which is elected every two years. That executive is supported by subcommittees and volunteers. The makeup of an NYC in the second diagram, you will see clubs, which emphasizes the grassroots level, organizations, youth groups, and the unattached young persons will be professionals and just young persons at risk. And of course, we have the student branch, which is autonomous, but attached to the NYC. So that is a, a typical example of a structure of a National Youth Council. This is what would exist without a National Youth Council, where every sector in society, MP for ministers of parliament, you have the, C the civil society sector, ministries, departments, all wanting to access young people from a variety of, 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 of areas. So everybody wants a consultation in the same month or on some particular day. It, they bombard the young persons. So what you want is an organized society where you have community structures, groups, right, clubs, groups in the community that are connected to each other, right, and represented nationally by a national youth council. And you have a flow of communication or representation at the national level. That is just an ideal presentation right there. General issues of affecting NYCs is that there is an evident lack of participation of youth. Youth still have very little influence in policy designs. There is also very little investment in national youth structures by our own CARICOM governments. Most of the investment made in this region into youth development has been made by external organizations, such as the Commonwealth Youth Program. Even this Scotland, I wouldn't go as far as saying that. But um, recommendations I want to present to this forum would be, I'm just trying to make sure I stick those before my time runs out. National Youth Councils should be established in every Caribbean country, supported by an act of parliament to govern and protect its existence, with an annual subvention allocated to assist in its prudent operations. Where they already exist, we should invest in building the administrative capacity. Caribbean countries to invest in the development of their own youth policies. I have no idea why on earth you need an external consultant to come in to develop your youth policy, but I may be wrong. Someone can educate me on that. But we should try to invest in our own development of youth policies. Caribbean countries to invest in the development of community club structures to suit the change in our socio-economic environments, because stronger clubs means stronger communities, and carry on to strengthen its current programs and support NYCs and the Regional Youth Council. Some examples of history, going back through history. This is a document of a book written during the time of the Grenada Revolution, showing how the National Youth Council supported the revolution in this article here. I won't let you read too much, but is there. St. Lucia, back in the 1980s. The St. Lucia Labour Party Youth Organization defends NYC in a press release. I'm just showing you the nature of the work that would take place in an active organization. Advocacy. NYC in 1986 wrote to the ministry, sorry, there's a letter dated 1980, asking for the creation of a youth policy, 1986. Youth wants minister dismissed. Now, that's just showing you some of the, the back and forth or the battles we had in the formation of our National Youth Council. NYC conference, student movements formed in, in, the 19, in 1985 in St. Lucia. So that's the press release on that. Make peace with NYC, not war. That's in the 1980s where we are trying to consolidate and become recognized don't blame the youth. 
CYP director calls for reduced student movement. And if you recognize that face, you're very good because he looks nothing like that today. <laughs> Mr. Henry Charles, General Secretary. Right? I wanted to read this script here because it's very important that we do not forget the importance of such organizations. And my time is almost up. So, more NYC presidents a disappointment to the youth, where young persons write back and state how they feel about the presidency or the executive and so on. And then more articles. But in the center here, you see, is NYC a dead society? That's the question most persons are asking. And so let's run through just a few examples of the NYC that are functioning now, whether dormant or very active or in between. Here you have the National Youth Council of Dominica's Facebook page. You will have a newspaper showing you about that council, but you can find them on Facebook to see who's active or who's not. And you can just look at the last post and you'll know who's active and who's not. September 27th. Here we have Bahamas, Barbados Youth Development Council, Guyana National Youth Council, National Youth Council of Jamaica, and you see all are sharing the Caribbean Youth Day logo. Nevis, St. Kitts National Youth Parliament, National Youth Council of St. Vincent of the Grenadines. Now, there you may, there are some questions that may be raised. Trinidad Youth Council, St. Martin, and the list goes on. Since my time is up, I will let you know what I would have said. This is an example of youth participating in Parliament. This is not a youth parliament. This is the National Youth Council literally presenting or debating the need for national youth policy to be revised. And that was in 2013 in the House of Parliament. All right. And I was showing you the global organization of movement. So there's a lot of work to be done. She's watching me about the time. There's a lot of work to be done in actually writing and articulating the movement of youth in the region and the world. The youth for European Youth Forum and the, the World Assembly of Youth are some of the most powerful entities in that movement. But guess what? We are there to the Pacific Youth Council as a regional body. You have the Caribbean Regional Youth Council coming on the scene. And you can see in a report on the 12th University of Youth Development in 2011, they met these regional platforms and they lamented the fact that there is no regional youth council in the Caribbean for them to liaise with. But that's no longer the case. Barbados, our first summit, Jamaica, our second summit, where national youth organizations came to discuss the constitution and formation of the CRYC. Our launch in December, and our latest achievement is being part of the 2015 Commonwealth Youth Ministers Meeting, Caribbean region, where we got them to actually endorse or, like this, you can see here, endorse the establishment of the Caribbean Regional Youth Council. So we are moving step by step into getting back to the place where we would. So, in summary, this is what I have to present on the movement or national youth councils in, in the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Thank you. First, thank Mr. Ferdinand for his excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to ask you to get some more meat of the presentation in the question. I'm sure that there's a lot more to be said about regional youth governance and local governance. Um, we're going to move next to Mr. Campbell. Uh, and uh, after Mr. Campbell, we'll, we're going to move the mic straight on down to Mr. Richard. Thank you. I'm actually going to stand for, for this presentation. The for persons who were here for the last session would have seen the presenter who was um, in the seat as well stand. And I tell you, my friend, it's extremely cold and this <laughs> <laughs> So I would rather take a break from, from, from that seat for, for a moment. Now, for, for this uh, presentation, I'm looking at student governance in Jamaica and essentially paying a bit of attention as to the enablers and barriers to student governance, to youth participation within their schools, within this decision-making processes within their schools. So, where did we go? <laughs> All right, there we go. Right, so essentially we're looking, I'm going to provide a, a, an overview as to the, the, the situation that exists currently at the junior high, the secondary, and the tertiary level as it relates to student governance. Now when we speak about student governance, essentially 
what we're speaking about are the processes, in the processes involved in the creation of a student government. By student government, we speak government of the students, by the students, for the students. Government democratically elected by students within their schools to represent the interests of students. Now, I use the term student governance because these bodies are, are, are according to a number of different names. They might have student councils, guilds of students, student unions. Uh, there's the United Students Movement at the Northern Caribbean University here. Uh, UTEC has a, has, a, has a student union and so forth. So there are a number of different names that are according to uh, these bodies. But essentially, they're set up to ensure that young people, that students are involved in the decision-making processes at their institutions and that they're also there to represent the interests of students having a voice in large part on the boards of such institutions. Now, for Jamaica, and, 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 and this, this, this work here is largely focused on Jamaica, for Jamaica there is the Education Act of 1980, which speaks in large part to the fact that every single public educational institution at the secondary and the tertiary level must have a student's counseling in place. Now, this is very important, and Jamaica is one of the few, uh, few countries worldwide that actually have this, 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 this provision in legislation. The student council movement in Jamaica is actually the only youth-led movement in Jamaica that is mandated by law. Right? Again, the, the education that knows every single public educational institution at the secondary and the tertiary level must have a student's council in place. It also makes other provisions for student participation. Uh, you would note uh, uh, provision C there speaks to the fact that the students must have the opportunity to meet with the principal on any matter concerning student student interests. Now, if we look into a little bit more detail as it relates to the boards of management, and this is a snapshot of that Education Act, we would note that for secondary institutions, uh, what at least one member of the school board must be elected by the Students' Council. Now, again, this is a very worthwhile provision. Very worthwhile provision. And, 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 and certainly, there must be commendations for having that step, having that provision in the legislation. However, at the same time, that is one step. Because what we find now is that while there is that provision and, and students must be represented on school boards, and we have seen an increase in the number of students who are represented on school boards, it begs the question also as to how is it that these students are selected. Because what we find then, that in most cases, the student representative on the school board is not from the student's council. We find situations where it is the head boy or, or, or an individual representative of the prefect system that is placed on the school board. So it is certainly a good step that we have the provision in place. But there are other, uh, there are other areas that we now need to look at as we go forward. How is it that that student, student is, represent, is, is selected for the school board? Is that student truly representative of the students within the, within the school population? The Education Act goes a little bit further to speak to all age slash junior high schools um, in Jamaica. Again, point to the same fact that in the case of an early school, a junior high school, there must be, again, at least one representative on the school board that is, that is selected by, or rather elected by, the student council to sit on that board. Now, when we look though at these institutions, first, there are a limited number of student council, student council that are actually present within junior high schools. So again, the provision becomes slightly null and void in the sense that the students are not then, the students who do sit on school boards are not necessarily then chosen by their peers to represent them. Because again, there's that limited provision uh, for student council at the junior high school, uh, the junior high school level. And a part of it has to do with the culture of such institutions because you would find that as you proceed from junior high to student to, to secondary to the tertiary level of, to, to the tertiary level of the education system, that there is a create a sense of culture um, as it relates to participation in, in student governance. We're proceeding through the, that, um, that structure of the education system. But if we consider participation along a, along a spectrum from informing students as to what, it, um, as to what um, occurs within their schools to empowering students to actively participate, to act actively engage in the decision-making processes, then we have somewhat of a guideline for, for seeing where our students are currently at as it relates to participation at the school level. Because what we find when we interview board chairmen, when we interview even students themselves, they see their role as largely being consultative. Uh, for if we look at this picture, you will see that consultation might lie towards the lower end of, 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 of public engagement. And that is largely the role that is seen for students um, uh, within their schools. Now, 
there, this needs to be put in some context though, because when you're speaking about employing students and having students being that, uh, that equal partner at the decision making table, when we get to that level, that high level, it also means that you're also accountable for the decisions that are taken. And you may find that, 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 that boards or principals themselves might, they are ultimately accountable for what it is that happens. So while students must be um, engaged in the process that goes forward, certainly we have to consider the extent to which we are engaging students as partners in the decision-making process that affect them as a, as a larger set of stakeholders within the school system. Now, if we look more closely at the, second, uh, the secondary level, um, when we look at this graph here, this graph speaks to the, the existence of students' councils in secondary institutions. You would know that in 2006, only 29% of, of secondary schools had student councils in place, had democratically elected student councils, I might add, in place. Uh, by 2010, however, that number rose to, is it 2010 or 2011? 2011, that number rose to 100% of schools, island secondary schools across Jamaica that had student courses in place. The number since then has, uh, has fluctuated slightly, but it's still at or about that, uh, that level. Now, part of the reason for this, and certainly what is necessary going forward, is one of the reasons why we saw that increase in student, in student leadership, starting um, in 2006, was the passage of the, of the, the new national youth policy. And certainly going forward, youth policy has to drive a number of these initiatives, has to drive youth participation. But it was not just policy because it was action on policy. So we had the policy in place. But what you also had was through the formation of the then National Center for Youth Development. There were a number of strategies put in place, and, a number of, and, and, and in particular the Strategic Plan for Youth Development put in place that focused heavily on student governance and heavily on ensuring youth participation at that level. So there was, a, there was, there was staff assigned to deal with student governance. There was uh, the revamping then of the National Secondary Students Council, and I'm pleased to uh, share a panel today with the, pre the current president of that council, Mr. Everton Ratchet. So, policy has to drive a number of these issues, but policy is one thing. Again, the action on policy is certainly necessary. Now, so we have, that, uh, we, have, we have seen a marked increase then in the number of stu um, schools that ensure that students are on their school boards. Again, there is a question as to how these students are selected. But that's, that, that is the next issue then that should, be, that should be tackled. What we find as well is that where student councils can be seen to be particularly active is, where, is in institutions where there is strong support from the school administration and from the staff. Certainly in instances where the student councils are not active, we find that uh, the, the administration certainly does not care much to uh, push, push student governance within their institutions. And that then is another, uh, is another area that we need to tackle because certainly a number of the, the principals certainly will again only see the students, if they do, as functioning at that consultative level. And we need to move a little bit further to seeing the students then as being active participants in the decision-making processes, again, that affect their own lives. Now, some of the challenges noted here, uh, certainly everybody cries for resources, uh, uh, there's uh, uh, there's uh, the issues that relate to maintaining enthusiasm and so forth. Another challenge that I want to highlight, highlight is the at the student at the school level there's sometimes a little a bit of disconnect between the prefect body and the and the and the student council system. Uh, in, I've been to some schools where I'm told that the prefects are the police and the student councils are the are the lawyers for students. And there's that little disconnect that, that again going forward needs to be addressed. Uh, my, my own view is that while the prefect is in strict charge of discipline within the institution, certainly as a leader within the school, the student council should also be promoting discipline within that institution. I, I do not see necessarily them being an antagonistic relationship, but one that both parties should be working together towards the betterment of, the, of that institution. We see then a strong culture of governance at the, at the tertiary level, but this again needs to be put in context. Because certainly with, thank you very much, Shamal. <laughs> because certainly with, uh, we see where with the universities and colleges, there's a stronger culture. But as we go then to teachers' colleges and then further to community colleges, again, we see where much of that needs to be strengthened. The, and even at the university level, some might argue that there's not necessarily that, uh, that strong culture at the university level of student governance, but rather there's a strong culture on the halls of the universities as it relates to student governance and the wider community, the community, commuting rather population is not necessarily as interested as we would want them to be in, um, in, in student governance, again, the issues that affect their institutions. 
So, uh, we've gone through a bit of that. I want to highlight the recommendations at, at, at a national level. Again, we see where policy drives a bit and we see where the legislation is important and has, uh, has proven beneficial. But there needs to be additional support to this post, uh, to, to government and to the ministries of youth and culture and also the Ministry of Education, as it really is providing information and resources to students, to student council staff advisors, to our school administrations as to place what it is that the council is for and should be doing. Uh, what is not so strong, and certainly we need to document a lot more, is research relating to student governance, not only within the, in Jamaica but also within the Caribbean. There's a dearth of research as it relates to that. Uh, as it relates to that. And while, uh, and I think Timothy spoke earlier to the institutional memory as it relates to the, the, um, the youth council, and, and it's much similar for student governance. So persons might speak to the 80s and what uh, persons at the university would have done as it relates to advocacy and so forth. But it's, it's, it's that research, that documentation of those, uh, of those activities, of those initiatives is not always there. And it goes even further at the secondary level. We find that we cannot um, access such information. And that is necessary towards building the case for student governance and building the case for youth participation in, again, in the decision-making processes that affect them. I thank you. So more than everyone. More than everyone. Mm -hmm. right, I just basically go through. Mr. Campbell mentioned a lot of things as related to student council. So I just basically give a synopsis of what our um, presentation will be about. So it's an assessment of the stakeholders' view of the students' council participation in public secondary institutions, region one and six. So region one and six. Alright, so let me give you an overview of what NSC is about. So the National Secondary Student Council was established in 1975 through a policy brought before government in 1973. The Education Act protects us, which as Mr. Campbell mentioned, where it says that a student council must be on the board of all institutions, all secondary institutions. Um, the youth student council represent over 30,000 um, 30, students right across Jamaica. And it's one of the largest youth-led initiatives there is in Jamaica. So there are three different questionnaires that were developed for this research. One was one for the student counselors, which we'll go into detail um, after. Then there are regular students, and there is one for also board chairman. So the, the purpose of, the, of there is one for the staff advisor, which sorry about the board chairman, I should be staff advisor. So there are three different questionnaires, which we seek to compare different views when we get back to the questionnaires, which we'll go into detail. Um, the regions that I mentioned before, Kingston and St. Andrew, which is region one, um, region 6, which is um, St. Catherine and Clarendon. So what are the objectives of this research, however? One, to assess the awareness of um, secondary school st um, stakeholders and purpose and, fun purpose and functions of this um, student's council. To assess the extent to which schools and administrations are supportive of the student's council. And to assess the extent to which student's councillors believe they have input in the decision-making process of their schools, their school. As to the first objective, that is the awareness of secondary, stakeholder, um, secondary school stakeholders on purpose and function of student council. So what we did was, we asked, we asked several questions we've mentioned on, this, on the questionnaire. So the, one of the questions was, what do you think is the primary rule of student councillors? Um, as you can see here, we are 54% of the persons said it's to promote the involvement of students in the affairs of the school, which is really the, the primary uh, purpose of student council. And then you had a few other persons saying it's to promote the work of um, the work of the, the school administration to promote the, the peer counseling as well and also to the, as it relates to the disciplinary body. So what we interpreted from this is, for one, 54% of the respondents who did the survey are clear on the role of student council. This may result in effective carry out of duty. Um, on the other hand, 46% of the respondents have misunderstood the role of student council which then may translate into inability to execute their functions. So as you showed here, we have persons thinking of student council as, in, as peer counseling, as 
administrative related bodies, which would be the prefect body. So to some extent, so there's a misconception in terms of what is the role of student council. And then we ask the question, who is a student councillor? As you can see here, it is clear that the majority of the persons understand who is a student councillor, where we have 87% of the students say it's a student leader elected by their peers um, to represent the interests of the student, which is our primary responsibility, to represent the interests of students. And there, there's a few other persons saying other things related, like 2%, 4%, and the 7%, which is a minor thing that we don't really have to pay much attention to. At this point, <laughs> <laughs> as I said, the age of students who is a student council, is suddenly to reveal that they are not really familiar with the, the legal framework that enables the function of a student council. So they are aware that student council main responsibility is to make sure that students are protected by making sure they are, you advocate for their rights and so on. But they aren't aware of the actual document that Mr. Mr. Campbell reported to the Education Act that protects us, that gives us the legitimate, um, that allows us to actually work as student councillors. Then they ask the question, who do any of the legal framework which I just mentioned um, legitimize the role of the student counselor? Now this is really interesting because we have 58% of the persons not sure, as I mentioned, of which document actually allows us to work the way we do. So this is our serious problem that we have to adjust um, in schools. And then you have the 70% the of the persons saying it's the Education Act, which is the actual document. And then we have a, uh, the Child Care and Protection Act of 2004, which to some extent speaks to the role of student counselor, yes, that allows us to say that new participation is important, which is, which is in direct condemn, um, relationship to the Education Act, which, yes, is, so this, this answer, this answer to some extent is, is important. So we will have 3% and the 17% in relation to what student counsel is. Then the other acts are the Child, the Child Empowerment Act of 1980, Education and Legal Right of None of those. So this actually was a trick question that we put there as well. So what we say, our well, interpretation of the, um, from that is that 80% is not sure of which document protects us, as I mentioned, in this indi uh, indicative of a lack of sensitization, which may also impact in the legal um, level of student participation. So we have persons not, thank you. So we have a decrease in the level of participation due to aware, um, um, lack of awareness. This also impacts the negative the level of facility, uh, facilitation provided by those stakeholders um, with responsibility to guide the work of the student council. So the persons who are responsible to guide us aren't aware of what actually was the rule, um, the power that we have. So this is a serious problem. So there is need for sensitization, which I'll mention um, later on. Then our second objective to assess the extent to which schools, um, administrators are support of the student council. Do you think the student counselor can address the staff meetings of the and yeah, discuss with the teachers this is affecting them? So this is really important to us because if we can't have a relationship to show them that these are the problems that we have, we will have serious problems. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Also, you guys following? You guys are following? Okay. Um, so we had here the student counselors. Ninety-one percent believe that yes, they have the, they can discuss with teachers. They believe. So this is the thing, they believe that they can actually discuss with teachers um, problems affecting them. On the, also, the question that was done for regular students, 60% of them believe that yes, they can actually do that. So the interpretation, large, student, large number of students, um, counselors alike, believe the student council process that builds the meet and discuss issues affecting their welfare. However, it is not certain if this belief is based on facts as alluded in the Education Act, enabling its right. So they, yes, they believe they can. But is it actually happening? So nonetheless, it is presumed that based on the indication in this study that they are not familiar with the legal framework. Can the students come to meet with the PTA to update each other on, on, on their activities and plans? 41% are not sure, 21% don't think they can, and yes, 38%. So you know, we have 61% who is not think they actually think they have that kind of um, ability to actually do that. So, interpretation of the finding case, again, there is a large uncertainty as a right. Student counsel to meet with other stakeholders and collaborate on important issues. So, you can't collaborate on important issues because the majority of them don't even think they can. And the third objective, which I'm trying to move really fast, my time is about to. So, that's the extent to which students, um, counselors, one more hell, um, hell, believe they have input in the decision, decision making process in their school. Should the student counselor re uh, receive notes of suspension of students? Oh, this is really important because 
if a student is being suspended, student, we our student council need to know why is that student is being suspended. Is that child's right is being abridged or we need to know exactly why. And as such, 71% say yes, they think we should receive it. 80% um, say they, they don't think we should. 66% um, say they're not sure. And this question was asked to student counselor and the staff advisors, not to the regular students. Then this is the, is this happening? No, this is the fact base now. Is it ha actually happening? No, we have 39% of the person saying yes. So before we, we saw where they think they should have, they actually should. But now we see where only 39% is it is actually believed that it's happening or she's saying that it's happening. And then we have 61% who say it's not happening. Then that is serious thing that we need to look into as well. Interpretation, while the finding indicates that students' counsel should receive those of suspension, the follow-up question shows that they um, actually are not receiving such suspension as I mentioned. Do you feel that the students' counselors are involved in the decision-making process of the school? So, do you believe? So we, here we have, just to let it clear, a regular students, which are um, regular students, student counselor and staff advisor. So, student counselor, we have 12% not sure, 29% don't think so, and, and, if, and uh, 59% say yes. Here we have 100% of the staff advisors say yes, they are involved in this job making process. So you need to look at the fact that staff advisors believe that yes, they are involved in the decision making process and then the students are not so sure if they are really involved in the decision making process and then you have the regular students who are also not so sure. So as I say, in the filing indicate that those staff advisors feel that student counselors are involved in the decision making process of the school, the students feel, um, feel that they are not really involved in the decision making process. So there's a misconception or there's a, an idea that the teachers believe that yes, we are, we are, they are actually involved and the faculty advisors believe that they are involved and the students don't believe they are involved. So the faculty advisors believe that they are actually working at their maximum capacity where yes, they are really doing good, but students aren't really involved when you ask them the question. Um, this way really suggests that students counsel are like feel that they are not really part of the process of decision making. As a conclusion um, drawn from this is that Conclusion drawn from this is that youth are disengaged as to what the student codes as student governance is about. There's a, there's, so there needs to be sensitization as it relates to that. There's a misconception of the part of the stakeholder as to what student codes is about. Um, administration or support of the student counselor in their eyes, but it is not in the eyes of the student counselor and the regular student. Um, stakeholders need to sensitize on what the functions and functions and purpose of student council is. You need to be more involved in this job making process of the school. A few recommendations as it relates to that um, stakeholders need to be sensitized about the function and purpose of student council as I mentioned before. Workshops need to be held to improve the capacity of student counselors to carry out their duties, strengthen the level of communication between stakeholders um, to teach, um, stakeholders. So student counselor, for example, student counselor, a student, student counselors and staff advisor. So this is basically a synopsis of what we are having in the schools right now and what are some of the things that we're doing. Also to mention we have in a training program this year where we have the six regions right across Jamaica. We have a capacity building workshop for each region where we're expected to train over six, um, over 800 um, students actually to effectively carry out their duties. We had region five the other day in Portland, um, in St. Mary I should say, which was really a success. Um, so that's basically my presentation. Thank you. Good morning, you should say. Uh, my name is Eunice Delis. Um, I will be presenting on a research project that I have been undergoing for the past couple years. The title of the 
project displaces of Asian college students, student leadership development, and the plight of civic engagement. A brief overview of this project. Um, I'll go through the topic with you, reasons why I was interested in undergoing this topic, some of the theoretical foundations I used to support my research, key findings from the case study that I conducted, and implications as well as next steps. The research topic. The topic that I chose to really delve into is student leadership development. Student leadership development is a major part of student formation. It influences how students think about themselves and influences how they see themselves as part of the community and as stakeholders, if they're able to see themselves as stakeholders. I chose to do this study in Haiti um, and the main question that I had was whether or not students were given access to conversations about civic engagement and whether or not there were barriers to students being involved as well. So in order to truly understand why I chose to focus on college students, you'd have to understand the history of youth in the development of independence and democracy in Haiti. In January of 1804, youth played a very pitiful, uh, pivotal role in claiming the independence of the nation. Since then, Haiti has experienced quite a few economic devastations. The, the economic devastations that I expressly decided to focus on in my research were the three earthquakes of 2004, 2008, and the most recent in 2012. During the rebuilding process of the earthquake in 2012, it was, very, it was very clear that youth did not have a voice at the table. However, what was also clear was that there was the facts that were being misplaced. Haiti is a young country. 71.1% of the population are between the ages of 15 and 29. This I use as a basis to identify youth as key stakeholders in the direction of the country. In that, universities become stakehold managers. Now, stakehold management is a term that's most closely used in business and product development. The idea behind it is that the stakehold managers are key persons who are cultivating, cultivating an area, cultivating a culture of success by identifying what's needed in the community by ensuring that, that the resources are available to those in the community in order to, to the stakeholders in order to be successful in their ventures, to act, actively engage the stakeholders through their various activities such as civic education, such as social res responsibility training, and so on, and to keep informed, keeping the stakeholders informed of various changes in the community and how they can be better integrated in order to really address these changes. The main tool in stakeholder management is civic engagement. So the research goals here were to 
truly understand how to empower college-aged youth in order to bring change into the community. In order to truly get to the crux of how, how this can occur, I decided to speak to college-age youth directly. And prior to speaking with them, I had a few underlying assumptions. The first of which was that civic engagement was the key, would be the key to sustaining democracy in Haiti. Why this is so is because civic engagement was the key in order to establish democracy in Haiti. Therefore, it would be the key in order to ensure that democracy is fervent in the nation. Also, student leadership in conjunction with social responsibility training could also further this effort of sustaining democracy. I realized undergoing this research that there was not much out there in terms of scholarly research on social responsibility training of college students. I decided that it was important to truly look at this under a microscope, under a microscope and see whether or not this was indicative of there not being institutions willing to undertake social responsibility training or whether it was viewed as something that was important. In order to truly understand whether or not this was given importance, I decided to base my research out of one of the largest state universities in Haiti, which is the, universe, the State University of Haiti, which is there and is the title of the uh, university, or UEH. In order to truly understand what I'd be undergoing, I had to grapple around a few theories. There were two main theories that supported my research. The first was the social, make, the social change model of leadership. This model was devised by the Higher Education Research Institute um, based in the US. This model has the seven C's of social change. Those are collaboration, common purpose, controversy with civility, consciousness of self and congruence, commitment, and citizenship. Each of these legs of the social change model are marred together in order to ensure that individuals who are truly interested in seeing change occur in their community have a foundation of core values that are being developed upon. In conjunction with the social change model, I also felt that social cultural competence was something that needed to be addressed and needed to be truly delved into in order to see whether or not social responsibility and civic engagement was really being taught and really being, if the students were really being exposed to these concepts and being prepared to be citizens within the community, to be engaged within the community in order to truly speak to the needs of their respective communities and regions within their country. So this idea of social cultural competence is the last phase in socializing civic minded students in order to assist them in shaping their community. There are quite a few legs, there are three main legs of this model. There's culture-based education and language, which 
in Katie's model would mean that there would be an influence on delving into the rich history of civic engagement as it mars with democracy, with the democracy um, and sustaining democracy in the country. Okay, Ms. Cindy's. Uh, the second one? We're really enjoying your presentation so far. Uh, I'm sorry? We're really enjoying the presentation so far, but in the interest of time, we're probably going to have about three three minutes left for your presentation, uh, just so that you would be able to monitor your time. So I don't know if you perhaps want to skip ahead to your findings, perhaps recommendations. Oh. Okay, you said I have three minutes, correct? Yeah. Okay, so I have a few more slides. Um, so I'll run through. Um, so the second leg is social emotional development and culture identity. This is exposing students to rich areas of the culture and helping to understand how promoting cultural understanding can be used as a tool for community development. And the third is educational outcomes and student engagement. This bridges on ensuring that there is a student leadership development uh, committee or group of persons who are focused and interested in ensuring that students have space to really delve into key societal issues. The methods that I undertook during this research were that of focus groups as well as some informal uh, conversations. These were very purposeful because I needed to truly get to the root of folks who were thinking about these concepts. During my interviews with students, there were a few main perspectives that were voice. There was lack of space for students to truly um, express themselves. Many students des describe the dichotomy between themselves and administration. And it was clear that the application of social change model as well as social con cultural competence was not present. Educators had a different view. They strongly believe that a strong sense of citizenship development would help to alleviate some of the societal issues that are plaguing sustainable development, but they believe that the department faced so many adverse, uh, such an adverse climate in order to truly give students access to civic engagement experiences and civic education. The list of obstacles continues. Um, in addition to access, there was there are very there are quite a few financial constraints, as well as spatial constraints, in order to make civic education and civic engagement activities accessible to students. The vision that I have for the university, in order to truly grapple around and address this issue is to devise a campus compact of sorts, which would be a document that truly outlines ways in which they can give students access to space, give students access to the education they need to prepare them for the labor market and prepare them to be active citizens and also to help them see the tie between their development and the development of their communities. Okay, Mr. A second part of that is major investments need to be made. Hi, we're gonna... And this is my last slide. Okay. Um, for this research, there are many areas that can be expanded upon, um, such as looking at the role of music and religion, looking at outside environmental forces, um, that may be a constraint to the university. Uh, replicating this same research in a private institution, as well as exploring center, exploring uh, various centers of education, and seeing how we can make them the forefront 
in the conversations as rebuilders post-disaster. And that is the end of my uh, presentation. Sorry, it was a little um, rushed there. I was trying to be conscious of time. Thank you very much for your amazing presentation. So we're going to move very quickly into questions. Remember, uh, one sentence for a comment and then a question. Uh, your presentation can't be longer than the panelists. So quickly, quickly. Okay. The screen froze, so I'm not sure if anyone was talking. Okay. Um, my first question is for Tim Timothy, and you know what I'm, what I'm going to ask you. How are we going to start a national food council in Haiti? And Mr. Miss Davis, I'm Mr. Alibioli from Haiti. I'm um, a, a scholar of Haitian Education and Leadership Program Help. I, I don't know if you know about uh, this program in Haiti. It's a, it's a scholarship program for that gave um, support to high school students who go to university, university in, in Haiti. So my question is, what do you think about civic education and citizenship education in primary and secondary school? What is the, what are the lack of um, effective education in civic in civics, and uh, what what are, what is the impact on on the life of um, college student in in Haiti? Okay, um, I heard parts of that question. You said, what is the impact of lack of civic education in, in what part of the country? In Haiti? Um, I, I, I'm asking, what, what, what is the impact of the lack of civic education in primary and secondary school on, on uh, student college, uh, um, uh, student college? Okay. Right, um, Ms. We're, we're gonna take Two more questions, so just hold uh, the question and, and your answer, and we'll take two or, or three more questions and then we'll have the panelists answer uh, in, in some. So very quickly, okay. 20 seconds, 30 to 30 seconds for the question. Yeah. Well, I froze when you said 20 seconds, seriously. Um, Timothy, uh, the question I came, that, that I came to ask, I think, um, Everton kind of answered it in, in context of the student councils. Um, I also was a, a member of a, a national youth council, but there's always a question that's being asked by other young people and the, the people we work with or, or for or whatever, what's the purpose of a national youth council and is it really serving any purpose? Or even, are they still um, relevant in, in modern society? So my question to you, I mean, I'm, to me, it will be the how, but I think um, Everton and they did an excellent piece of work as far as what perceptions are, the needs, etc. Um, but if you were to say it is, is it, and, and how can you show us the, the continued relevance of a youth council? Next question. Um, I have a statement first and then a question. My statement is to Mr. Campbell, who he stated earlier that um, on campus, the commuting students aren't interested. They are interested, but they're just not engaged properly. Because most of the time, the commuting students aren't the 18-year-olds that are just coming out of high school. They are probably like 20-odd-year-old people who really have an interest, but really isn't being engaged properly as the ones on hall. And my next thing is, is the student council itself in Jamaica? I be from my personal belief, I think that is just something giving students an incentive to walk up and down and say, oh, I hold a badge or a position. But the purpose of the student council back in my days, we were advocates for students. You know, whatever was done, we tried to ensure that they're getting some proper representation, like lawyers, as we said earlier. But is it the same thing now? Because I believe you guys don't have a voice. I believe you are silenced by the administration of the school. So. All right, and I will see the ears and the gentleman in the back. Um, so we'll take those. In. 
Yeah, so continuing and then... Um, it's just building on from um, what he just um, said. I wanted to ask um, the student council um, in terms of how are you linked to your National Youth Council here in Jamaica? How do you collaborate with them? And if you do, how did you get um, become a part of um, the National Youth Council? And then I just wanted to comment also in terms of um, the role of National Youth Councils. Um, I really see that National Youth Councils um, play a major role in bridging that gap between all the um, youth constituencies at the grassroots level and with our, um, with our government. So if National Youth Council doesn't really play its role or step up to its um, role, then it also then leads to that issue of um, youth representation that has been so often mentioned um, throughout the three days. Good afternoon. Mr. Kemp, in your presentation, you said that sometimes the school would elect persons such as head boy to be a part of the board, but then you also said that head boy and student council sometimes share a similar role and responsibility. Now, Mr. Everton, actually, I understand that you're the national student council president and you're also the head boy for the school. My notion of that, that those are conflicting interests. It is. Can you tell me the similarities and the differences, please? It's conflicting. It's conflicting. One final question. Sure. Up on the question of the relevance of the National Youth Council. Um, my concern is that the young people, I don't think they really think that the National Youth Council represents their voice as a concern for me. Um, and another thing, what I've observed. It's, that, it's, it's almost like the cycles of the generation of young people now, like yourself. So you're active in this regional movement to get the regional youth councils up and so But when you leave, there's a gap. It's almost you have to always do this. The new um, cycle of young people have to go through the same process you go through. So there's almost no, no continuity. And the beneficiaries of what you're fighting for, you want to benefit from it, and the next generation has to fight again for, for, for that kind of benefit. All right, so we will start with the question to Ms. Delise on the influence of primary and secondary civic education on, on college level students. Marisha, just one important question in regards to gender. How, uh, what percentage of our females are on student council? And national yeah. council, yeah. yeah. All right, Ms. Delise. Okay. Um, so the question that was posed earlier was, what's the, what was the influence of lack of civic education and civic engagement um, in Haiti? Primarily, you were talking about the secretary school. Um, what we're seeing is there is uh, a brain drain that's occurring. So students are going to school and they're being educated and, and given all these valuable academic skills and really developed, but we're losing all of that talent to countries like Canada and the U.S. because there's not really a draw to stay within the country. And for those students who do not have the opportunity to you know, go abroad and further education or seek jobs abroad, they stay within Haiti, but the skills that they've amassed within the college are not really used to better their communities uh, because there is there is a lack of, of jobs as well. So what needs to happen is there needs to be a conversation as to what happens after. Once these students are, are engaged in academic studies, how do we keep them engaged within their community, how do we get them to understand that they are pivotal to the progress of the country? Great, right, thank you for the answer. What we're gonna do in wrapping up the session because we don't have much time left, I'm going to allow the panelists to respond to uh, the questions that were posed to them. Uh, and then we're gonna allow them maybe 30 seconds to just uh, give a final thought uh, something, a takeaway, uh, but we're going to try to wrap up within the next five minutes. Thank you very much. On the relevance of National Youth Councils, I would highlight 
what we already know, the construct of society is that there is a government and there is civil society. As long as you agree, or we agree, that there is a need for government, there is a need for civil society to be active. The National Youth Council is a sector of civil society that is structured to represent young people. So the, I don't think that the issue is whether they are relevant. The issue for us nowadays is whether they are effective in we could say, um, representing young people. So yes, they are relevant, there's no question, because even last night you heard the contribution that has been made by National Youth Council and continues to be made by National Youth Councils. And the product of leaders you get from them, they contribute to the positive side of society. So we should just focus on trying to build up the structure. It has to evolve into something else or be modified, we do that, but we keep and ensure young persons have a space that's created for them in governance. Um, apart from that, Haiti. Haiti. Well, we know it takes a spark for a fire to catch. The first thing is knowing that Haiti already has youth groups. I'm pretty sure there are groups on the ground. A National Youth Council is based out of groups that exist. So there has to be some sort of will by the young people. That's one. A catalyst, maybe a group of persons who are always who find themselves in the forefront, going to government, going to those groups, trying to make a connection and show that there's a need and they can always use the templates that are existing out there. Show the templates of the sister countries, what's happening around the world, and make your case for the establishment of a National Youth Council and you, you will go from there. That's my advice. All right, to start with the, the purpose of the student council. The, certainly, as, 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 as you indicated, the purpose of the student council is advocacy, is raising student awareness on issues affecting them, and is involving students in, 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 in the discussion, the dialogue on those issues that affect them, certainly. Now, I would agree with you that there are a number of issues that we would expect or we would want for students to have that interest in and voice their opinions on where we do not necessarily see that dialogue coming out. I remember like, like sometimes the other day uh, you would have discussions on the issues of conduct in schools, for example. And I was particularly perturbed that we were not seeing students voicing their opinions, voicing their issues, they, they, uh, having their say on this issue that affects them directly um, uh, within the school. And there are a number of issues. We speak of, can speak to violence and a number of other issues uh, within our institutions. So there's certainly a lot of work that needs to be done as it relates to raising student awareness, uh, certainly within the sec at, at the secondary school level of the broader national issues. We find that a lot of times when we have our students' councils within the schools, there are you know there are some issues that need to be tackled, such as the canteen, food, and and and, 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 and such, um, such such matters. But again, there are broader issues that affect our student councils even within within across parishes and nationally. And certainly, I believe Mr. Ratchet can speak to a little bit more of that as it relates to some of those issues and what is that student council should be doing um, to tackle those. But certainly, there is a lot of work to be done as it relates to advocacy. Part of it has to do with training um, our student councillors. And the Ministry of Youth and Culture has been doing some work where that is concerned. There are, um, Mr. Ratchet spoke earlier to some training seminars that are, that are upcoming that should be focused on that. But again, I also noted um, towards the end that there is a need for um, the, 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 the the, the, the collation of that research and also of, the, of resources for student councils and for, uh, for our student council staff advisors and school administration as it relates to student councils to better aid our student councils in, in, in responding to some of these challenges that affect them. Uh, I will touch briefly on the matter of uh, the, the relationship between the prefect and student councils. I think the the bigger point is that there are two bodies that exist within the schools and certainly I would anticipate that both of them have the same objective at the end of the day. The same objective as it relates to ensuring student employment and ensuring that our young people are able to maximize their potential. There might be different means to which they seek to accomplish that, but ultimately it is important that both bodies are working together towards achieving that objective. And not even just the, that, just the private body and the student councils, but also the other institutions within the school. The Parent Teachers Association, uh, the, the teachers within the school, the auxiliary staff, the principals, the, the, the school board. So all need to be working um, together in that regard. I, I would posit that the student councillor serves, serves clear, as they would say, the, the role of being the lawyers for students. Uh, but if it is that the student council is selected by, elected rather by students and the private elected by the school administration, there may be that conflict of interest that exists. If it is that the, 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 the objectives of the students 
the area slightly from the objectives of the, of the school administration. So that uh, conflict of interest can result, certainly. But again, it is important that that dialogue be in place so we are working together to, um, towards achieving the, the ultimate objective of ensuring that our young people maximize their potential at the school level. Um, just to close, I think Everton made a, an extremely important point um, in going through his, uh, his presentation. And certainly it's not a point that is lost upon me. The point that our student or, or the, the school administration were very um, assertive or very strident in their views that they were encouraging student youth participation at the school level. But the students, the student council did not feel so. They, while there were certain provisions in place, they did not feel that they had the access to the information. It, it calls for a little reflection on our part as service providers and as youth development practitioners to really for some self-reflection to see if it is that while we say that we are providing um, the avenues for youth participation, if it is that we are actually providing such avenues, and if it is that our young people see these avenues as, as, as worthwhile to be accessed um, based on how it is that we... Oh, 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 oh.